you saw me mill the slot in here before and this is the reason so that when I have it chucked into here in this um well I put this adapter this is a Capto 8 adapter that I've mounted onto this uh, steel piece here and then I could chuck it in the forge I chuck and get this running as true as possible in here but I noticed there was some run out on this and I was trying to indicate it so so what I did was I I put this back in the spindle of the mill the milling spindle over here and I and I mounted this turning tool here in this uh, Capto adapter and I just skimmed the OD with this running with this running in the milling spindle so it's running true to the spindle of the mill and uh, then I, I took it out and put it back in here and I've indicated everything in to run as concentric as possible within about um, I don't know two or three ten thousandths of an inch and now I need to I need to indicate this which I already have adjusted to run um, horizontal here or parallel to the y-axis so that my alignment to my program is correct when it goes to do the milling. Now I want to I want to um, check the center in uh, x and y so I got to bring it to zero in x and y and then I'm going to um, It's important when you indicate something in the horizontal mode to or a horizontal orientation I should say to try to get this distance as short as possible on the indicator arm because gravity is is uh, fighting against you here I'm just going to swing this around just to check it initially I know this is running, I already rotated this and it's running very true so I don't need to worry about rotating the part otherwise I'd be rotating the part with the, with the indicator as I went around so that I'd be indicating on the same spot on the part in, in the event there was run out. But I know there isn't in this case or there's very little. It's probably uh, only a few a few ten thousands. See, we're off a little bit in the Y. It's a cold day today. It might be that things are a little bit cooler on the machine. It's important that I get this as, as true as possible. In fact, I might even check this again after I do some turning. Maybe the machine warms up a little bit because uh, I want these inserts to be as close as possible to the right location, the insert pockets when I mill this in here. So I'm gonna set the um, fixture offset here. I gotta go to the work offset page. I'm gonna bring the cursor, this is the offset I'm using, G54. I'm gonna bring the cursor down here to uh, X and I'm going to go teach zero and push input and the same thing teach zero input I've already set the C zero previous to this so now we go back to the position page if I hit reset here you'll see these should go to zero so we're except for the Z I've already set the Z as well with the hammer indicator so we're ready to start the machining process. Spindle has to be oriented on this machine in order to extract the tool. What are we trying to do here exactly with this tool? You see this, the end of the part here, it has a, an internal key in the bore. And in order to machine the sides of this key, I need to do something I can't get a milling, well I could tip a small, a very small probably um, end mill if I had, let's look at the part this way, if I had the part um, 
oriented perhaps like this. I know it's kind of hard to see here. And I could tip the tool in here with the B axis, something like this, and come in here and machine this side and then rotate the part this way. And I, and I may do a little of that to rough it out, but I can't really get down into here because this, um, this radius here is like a um, 30 thousandth radius and it would be very difficult with a 16th inch ball end mill to get in there and, and machine all that so I've done there's then there they happen to have left a gap between this face here and the bottom of the of the key so that I could come in here with a shaping tool of some sort to shaping or broaching whichever you want to call it and get in there and so what I'd have to do I'd be left with some kind of a um, material in here and really the part would be positioned with the key at the top um, more like this and I'd be shaping at the top so I, I designed this tool like you you've seen me starting on here let me get rid of these sketches I don't need that and although the tool isn't oriented the correct direction right now because I had it oriented for the machining in the in the Mazak but you can see these inserts this would form one side of the of the um, key and, the, and this would form the other side of the key and I can the beauty of the of the multitask machine is I can index this uh, tool and and clamp it in place so that it it doesn't rotate so I can get in here and machine the um, eat out the rest of this material by rotating just rotating the C axis actually I, I would line up the insert with the bore and just rotate the C axis in little increments and plunge in in Z and back out back and forth until I, I get up to my finished profile so that's that's what we're doing here with this tool but of course we got to make the tool and you notice earlier in the video I pointed out this notch in the in the um, capto shank and how it, it needs to align with the these inserts vertical like this so that when I can orient the spindle at, at the normal position these will be vertical this way and then I can orient it 180 and clamp it and they'll be and I'll be using this insert on this side of the tool to do the other side of the key so this video is going to be about making this tool here's the machining operation this is the first tool a CNMG 432 insert the blank holder had about 800 thousandths too much stock on the face so I'm just facing it off with uh, small cuts just to avoid too much deflection on the part And then I'm going to turn the OD, I think we're taking an eighth of an inch, no, a hundred thousandths depth of cut, twelve thousandths feet on this OD cut here. I'm trying to machine as much of this as I can dry so that I can record it for the video. But of course, the drills and such, I couldn't run dry, so I had to run coolant on them. There's a the facing tour. I've only got to finish the face because the OD is going to be all milled away later. Spot drill for the, um, ultimately there's going to be an eighth inch MPT plug in the middle there. It's a pilot drill for the uh, 218 thousandths diameter gun drill to drill all the way through for coolant passage. So that's what's happening here. Um, most all the video of the machining in this is going to be uh, sped up because I, I'm trying to fit about two hours worth of machine cycle time in about 15, I don't, I don't know, 12 or 15 minutes here. Milling flats for the uh, spot drill for these angled coolant holes that come up to the inserts. I'm going to have some kind of flat to put the spot on. Here comes a spot drill, and then there'll be a pilot drill for a three millimeter pilot drill for a three millimeter gun drill. 
after this. This is what this is. The machine has to move back like that because the angle has to change with the B-axis in, in the post-processor. It just automatically moves back to that safe clearance location is the reason it's doing that. It's a three millimeter gun drill. This is sped up so it looks a lot faster than it really is. But you can see it drills all the way through and the coolant comes out the center hole right there. Here's the beginning of the OD milling, a four, uh, half inch four flute carbide end mill. I started with no coolant, but then so you see how the shavings are kind of building up there, so I turned the air on through the spindle, so you might be hearing that hissing noise. That's what that is. And that helps blow the shavings away. Might help keep the tool a little bit cooler too. This isn't the most efficient way probably to mill this, but it was easy to program it this way, so that's what I did. And it actually left kind of an interesting pattern from the tools cuts on the OD. I was taking no finish passes on any of this because it really doesn't matter. It's just clearance. Everything has to be below the cutting edges of the inserts on the tip where that happens and the rest of it's just clearance. So it really isn't critical. And I don't know what they make these holders out of, these blank holders, but it actually machines pretty decent. It doesn't machine too difficult. The only real issue I had was, I think after this, Flat, but it's milling here, it mills the other flute, if you want to call them that, for this tool right here, it's starting it. And on the final pass, when it got up into that corner, it actually broke a couple of the tips of the end mill off. If you listen carefully, you'll be able to hear it. You can sort of see the beginnings of that coolant hole right there. Right here, if you listen carefully when it goes in that corner, see it broke the tool. But it wasn't cutting too bad, so I let it run to the end of the pass. But I have to take it out and, and change it and continue on. You can see why I need to start that coolant hole before I did that milling there, if you look. See it broke the tip off the tool there was like one flute left and that was enough to finish that pass. So here's the new tool. I'm going to have to touch it off and uh, restart the program after all of that. I didn't even, here, here I'm setting the offset for the tool. I didn't even uh, rerun the, the pass that it broke on because it seemed like it was, it, it didn't look bad so I didn't rerun and I just started right after that. I was debating whether to cut most of this out of the out of the video, but I tried to skip ahead, like not show all of this because I think it'd be getting kind of monotonous. But um, and it's also sped up, obviously, quite a bit. So this is the last pass, or the last face, I guess you might say, of this tool right there. And I had to come in and set up a, a little end mill to rough out and finish the bottoms of the pockets, but finish the wall square with this 330 seconds diameter end mill. A little difficulty 
recording video here because the, the collet chuck is so big in diameter compared to the end mill. I thought about putting it in a shrink holder, but I didn't have any that weren't being already set up for some other purpose. I didn't want to undo them. So I kind of tried to zoom in here, but it didn't really get too much better. The Mazak's milling spindle returned 10,000 RPM. So it actually does pretty good with this little teeny end mill. And I was able to run it dry as you see here and it didn't even break the tool. That's some kind of little adaptive type milling cycle there. So there's the basic pocket with square sides. And I'll come in with a tapered end mill to mill the, the seven degree angles that the insert requires. Now the beginning of this clip here is at normal speed. And then this speeds up on this side to 10 times faster. Right there. It looks like the part's moving, but actually the because the camera's stuck on the spindle, the the um it looks backwards. The spindle is actually moving here, but it looks like the part is. So there's the two pockets with the square sides now, and then I got to um, first I drill and, and uh, thread mill the four millimeter screw holes. So here's spotting for the tap drill, four millimeter by 0.7 pitch thread. I happen to have these tools set up from the previous job of the, of the super duplex already, so it had a thread this size, so I used the same tools from it. I'm just making sure I stood off the offset a little bit so that I wouldn't machine it oversized. I had to rerun the tool here to get it to size. Now here's the tapered end mill, the seven degrees per side carbide end mill. Uh, sixteenth of an inch diameter on the tip. And I, I'm not taking this, I milled the, the pocket actually a little bit bigger than the base of the insert so that this taper doesn't really go all the way down to the, the bottom of the pocket so there's kind of a little bit of a relief at the bottom. I had to run it a number of times. I'm just showing you the first and the last passes here to get it to the size and fit I wanted. I like to make these insert pockets fit a little bit tight because they generally get looser as the tool gets used. So I had to kind of knock this one out of there with the one, two, three block. And the last tool is a eighth inch NPT thread mill with a pipe plug that plugs off the coolant hole in the middle. I wanted to make this fit flush or below the face so that it wouldn't hit anything. This Capto um, adapter uses a retention stud, but normally, you see it there, but normally the Capto tool holder doesn't require a retention stud when it's used in the machine. Just that adapter thing requires one. Doing a little deeper work here with the NSK grinder. Kind of see the pattern that that milling tool left on the outside of the part. Kind of left an interesting pattern. I was kind of thinking to take the Scotch Brite wheel in the grinder and buff it off, but it looked kind of neat, so I left it that way.
check the um, fit of the inserts again in here and uh, put the pipe plug in the center of the tube. Just make sure everything fits correctly. I'm just checking to see if the insert edge is outside of that flute area. So the only thing I didn't really care for was those little mismatches on the face. You can see them there. So I went and got an angle grinder and I ground those off. They don't really matter to the function of the tool. It would work fine with that like that, but I just don't want to look at it like that. Like I said, I didn't take any finish cuts on the milling on the outside, so the tool deflection, you know, it was when it went into that face, caused those. So in a future video, I'll, I'll show how I actually set this up and the, the code to make it function way it works. I've done this before on, a, on another part. I made a video on it. I think it's called shaping up around the shop, something like that. So that's a finished tool. Thanks for watching.